All right, let's get started. Um, thanks all of you for coming. Um, I'm Emily Mitzkavages. I'm a fourth year in Michael Fee's lab at BCS. Um, and I propose this tutorial series because series I really like computational neuroscience and I like learning with other people about these topics. Um, recently, BCS has made efforts to strengthen its computational community. The department added computational components to its required undergrad classes um, and graduate classes. It hosts a new Center for Minds, Brains, and Machines and um, is making efforts to attract new computational faculty. Uh, the department's efforts reflect the field's increased demand for computational literacy. Recently, um, there's a brain initiative, and part of that states, inevitably, we must turn to theory, simulation, and sophisticated quantitative analyses in our search to understand the underlying mechanisms that bridge spatial and temporal skills, linking components and their interactions to the dynamic behavior of the intact system. True partnerships between theorists and experiments will yield large dividends for almost every conceptual and experimental problem to be tackled. So today, I hope you're all able to learn a little more about Bayesian approach, approaches and get hands-on experiences with the exercises, and also meet other people who are interested in computational topics. You're from a mix of backgrounds, and I hope you can collaborate and help each other out when we get to the exercises. Um, First, I'd like to introduce Evan, Evan Remington, a postdoc in Jazieri Lab, and Sam Gershman. Um, Evan and Sam are both in the back. Um, they, uh, so Sam recently started uh, his own lab at Harvard, and um, they helped come up with the exercises, and th they'll be here to help you answer all the questions when we're going to the exercises. Um, and I'd like to thank them a lot for all of their help with this. Um, I'd also like to thank BCS Seminar Committee and the Postdoc and Graduate Advocate Events Committees um, for funding. So we'll start with a short introduction to Bayesian approaches by Josh Tenenbaum, um, and then a lecture by Mirda Jazieri teaching you what you need to know uh, for the exercises. Thank you. I'll just say about five minutes worth and then hand it over to the people who actually did the work for the tutorial. Um, so first, thanks to Emily, to Evan, to Sam, who, who did a lot of the work, and to Meredith, who's going to give one of the main lectures here. And it's really cool that you're all interested in this topic. Um, I think, again, Emily said most of the things I think that needed to be said. The, the, the reasons to be interested in computation, there are a number of different ones. And this is also reasons to be interested in the kind of Bayesian methods that you see here. I think what's behind the BRAIN initiative, I'm not sure, um, is a little bit different, though, than, say, what's behind the CBMM. So let me just talk about those two two uh, kinds of motivations. Um, one is like computation as a, as a sophisticated way to do data analysis, right? It, like if you're generating lots and lots of data uh, on how the brain works at different spatial and temporal scales, you need some way to stitch it all together into a coherent picture of the function of the brain and sort of a causal model, right? You don't just want a lot of data, but you want to understand how the thing works as a machine. Um, another reason, though, to be interested in computation is because the mind and the brain is a computer. Now, it's probably many things, but I think it's one of our great insights and accomplishments as a field that we've come to understand and collectively agree that in some sense, the most powerful tools we have from a kind of a functional or mathematical uh, point of view in describing what the brain does and how it works is some kind of computation. And then we, you know, once we accept that, we can have a debate about what's the right kind of computation. To what extent is it like the kind of computers we're used to working with as technology? To what extent is it different? And so on, right? But to me, at least, the, the, the motivation for uh, looking at Bayesian models, um, and this is the motivation behind a lot of the math and computation, which is at the heart of CBMM, is not just as a tool for data analysis, right, but as a uh, tool for understanding, for making theories about how the brain works, and also how the mind works, and how to link the mind to the brain. I should say as kind of a parenthesis, um, you know, uh, probably many of you know that I teach a class uh, pretty much every fall, 966-9660-6804. It's a computational cognitive science class. And a lot of the topics that are covered here um, are also covered there. But I think actually it's, it's great to see a, a lot of people here, I think, are coming more from the neuroscience side, whereas my class is more oriented towards the cognitive side. And these kinds of ideas are very powerful ones, I think, for bridging the, br the brain and the mind levels. I think one of the, l let me just say two, um, again, two sort of uh, reasons to be interested in any kind of mathematical framework, but in particular for Bayesian approaches, if what you're interested in is theories, not just data analysis, but theories of how the brain works. So one is that I think um, if we want to bridge the different levels of analysis, like the, the cognitive level and the neuroscience level, 
it's not going to be through phenomena or data. It's going to be through math. It's going to, be, you know, if, if you take the language, if you take the, the data sets or the language, the words that cognitive scientists use to talk about the mind and the data and the words that neuroscientists use to talk about the brain, it's often very hard to see how they relate to each other. On the other hand, if you take the math that they use to talk about what they're doing, right, um, sometimes, excitingly, it's the very same math. So you already have that bridge. And that's one of the reasons, I think, to be interested in Bayesian methods, is that this is a kind of math that has been very successful over the past decade, maybe two decades, um, in, at, at both the cognitive and the neuroscience level. And it's really, very broadly, one of the best candidates we have, I think, for making that bridge between the mind and the body. Um, or I sometimes call this our modern mind-body problem, the mind and the brain or whatever. Okay, um, Not the mystical philosophical version of the mind-body problem, but it's a great scientific problem, right? How does the mind live in the brain or how does the brain give rise to the mind, if you like? I really don't think we're going to be able to answer that um, unless we develop shared mathematical understandings. And that's also at the heart of CBMM. Another reason, though, is to bridge what I think you could call the sort of science um, goals of our fields to what is maybe sort of the engineering goal. So across the street over there in CSAIL, right, computer science and AI lab, there are people trying to build AI systems. And these days, you know, AI is hot in all sorts of ways, in industry, in academia. Um, and this idea that uh, there's an engineering side of, of intelligence to go along with the science side that many of us do here, I think that's also at the heart of what we should be interested in. If our goal is to understand how the brain works, then, you know, as, as people like to often invoke the, the famous Feynman line, some version of, you know, that which I can't build, I don't understand, or if I understand it, I can build it, that sort of thing, right? If we really understand how the brain works, then we should be able to engineer some kind of intelligent computer that, that models those computations. Um, and this brings us back to actually the original, or the, the, the first thing I mentioned, which is, to, which maybe was what brought some of you here, the idea of computation as a tool for data analysis. One of, one of the things that's so cool about Bayesian approaches and so interesting is that, um, in, in a sense, they, they kind of help to see the, the link between data analysis just as a tool that you might use in your science and the function of the brain. This view that in some sense what the brain is doing is kind of making sense of data, doing a kind of statistical analysis, and in particular, building a functional causal model of the world um, through the data coming in through your senses. And this is something that Meridot is very interested in his research, and Evan and, and Emily also in her way, and that I think this will be a, a, a key theme here. Right? It, it, it's, it's sort of another version of it you might have heard, like say, from Laura Schultz, where you talk about the child is scientist, or that cognition is like kind of building theories and testing them out, hypotheses against data, doing experiments. Right? This is an idea which you can see at the cognitive level, like in Laura's work, or at the neuroscience level in Meridot's work. This idea that whether it's the mind or the brain, a, the fundamental thing that this organ is doing right, is taking in data, building theories and models, particularly causal ones, right? not just finding patterns, but causal models that you can intervene on. Just as like, you, know, you might do optogenetics interventions if you have a causal model of brain function, we're interested in how the brain builds causal models of the world that support our just natural interactions um, with it. So the techniques of, Bayesian, of the Bayesian sort of mathematical toolkit is interesting for all these reasons. And um, I hope that uh, you'll get something out of it from both from Meridad, from the exercises. And with that, I will turn it over to them. And I will come back maybe around 5 uh, and see where things are. Thanks a lot to Emily for doing this. She, uh, a long time ago, she, uh, she asked me whether something like this is possible, and I thought it's a great idea, and she kind of took it from there, um, applied for you know, some funding through the department, and now you have this series of, of uh, tutorials, which I think is fantastic. Josh mentioned some of the things that uh, you know, are great about Bayesian uh, methods. Uh, I'll you know, add with some very quick three examples. So. Um, Make a guess, how old am I? How would you make a guess? Kind of look at some features and, and try to guess. Now, um, anybody wants to venture? I'm not going to say you're right or wrong, just 12. go for it. 12. 12, perfect. Uh, sorry, what was that? 403. Okay, 403. So now, uh, how, how old is my dad? How are you going to solve that problem? How old is my dad? Uh, 
So quickly, I just want to see what are you thinking about? Just think about what you're thinking about. So, so you very quickly are tapping into some prior information you have about, you know, if I see somebody with these features, how old the dad might be, right? So uh, that's basically immediately you using some information from sensory information you grab from me, and then some information that is not coming from me is coming from your experience from other people and their dads, and you combine those two to come up with some number, okay? Now that's a classic version of using some prior knowledge and some measurement to make a sensory estimate. Uh, let's go quickly to a motor uh, uh, problem. So you know, I want to go grab Morteza. The problem is going to be that as I send the motor commands out, my hand won't go exactly where I want it to go. It will actually be erroneous where it wants to go. And in fact, there is a problem that my bra brain has to solve, which is the motor commands go in the coordinates of muscles. The sensory information is in coordinates of, you know, retinotopic coordinates. So there's some sort of a prior experience again that comes into play to say, when I see something there, how actually I uh, activate the right motor commands. Again, something, something internal and some sensory measurement. And examples of this happen all the time in uh, things that the brain does. Now the other perspective of this, which is the, the uh, sort of a, from a data, data analysis perspective, uh, you're all, you know, in one way or the other, presumably have con sort of connections to experiments, doing experiments yourself. Uh, as an experimenter, you continuously do this, uh, do this task. In the lab, you make some measurement, whatever your, your uh, problem is, you make some measurements, or somebody makes some measurements that you use. And then based on me those measurements that you make from a system that you don't understand, otherwise you wouldn't make those measurements, you want to make some inferences. And those inferences are based on the measurements you make and the inference strategy that you come up with to figure out what the system is given those measurements, right? Now, what strategy you use, you can have a variety of strategies. It turns out one of the good strategies is the Bayesian methods for making inferences about the state of the animal, state of the brain, state of the, the uh, neural signal, state of the, the genetic network, whatever it is that you're studying. If you want to infer the state, you make some measurements and then you're dealing with some uncertainty and you kind of uh, one of the good strategies that we get into to get at that problem is Bayesian uh, integration. Now, I wanted to go into a little bit more uh, details in the tutorial, but uh, I about 50% kind of will, it seems like it will serve better if I say a little bit more, sort of start from a little bit more basic based on the s survey responses. Thank you very much for for uh, doing the survey, that helps that helped a great deal in kind of uh, tuning where, where things are. So given what, what we uh, gathered from you, uh, I don't want to sort of quickly go over a bunch of stuff that then some of you will not be able to take advantage of. Given that, I am telling you it will be fairly simple, so those of you who, who came to uh, sort of elaborate on your already um, expertise in Bayesian, I won't take it personally if you just leave. It will be perfectly fine. If you feel like, you know, this is just too easy for you, it's fine. But, um, or start working on the exercise. Yeah, so, so oh, at the same time, you know, we have great TAs. Evan's here, Sam's here, and they're all as expert as I am, even better on the topics. Emily, you know, has already gone through all of this A to Z. So we can build on it if you uh, sort of want to build on what you know, and there will be stuff to learn. So here's the simplest version of the problem, something that, you know, now in the media, you probably have read about the, the stories about mammograms and medical tests. I'll start from here. So uh, this is just a very simple, intuitive sense of why Bayesian integration matters. So uh, a person goes to a doctor for a medical test for a rare disease. The test is pretty accurate. It gives a positive result for 90% of those who have the disease and negative for 90% that do not have the disease. Now, what are the chances that this person has the disease? Is the question clear? So I go to doctor. I know the test result works such and such. So 90%, 99% it will catch me if I have the disease. And if I don't have it, 90% it will say you don't have it. Now I go and uh, I do the test. And the test, something that I maybe didn't write here, the test comes out positive. OK, sorry? <laughs> that was not there, right? <laughs> The test comes out positive. Now, now, what are the chances? 
So those who think uh, less than 90%, hands up. Those who think 90%, hands up. Between 90 and 99? 99%? Well, that remains the last one. I don't know. <laughs> OK. Um, so let's think a little bit through this to build some intuition. So here's the, the key. Uh, I guess if I didn't, that, that the key to help you here is that you realize that this is a rare disease, okay? Let's put a number on this. So let's say rare means 2% of the population have this disease, okay? Now you go to the doctor and the test comes out positive. Now that I've given, put, you in, put a number on it. 2% of the population have the disease. The result comes out positive. Now do you think less than 90? Anybody? Okay, very quickly sort of the intuition builds, right? So as soon as you know it's a rare disease, it seems like now, even if it comes out positive, uh, maybe it's not right. So let's you know, put some very quick numbers on this. Let's say the population is, of a, is, in, is in a town of 1,000 people and 2% have the disease, it's a rare disease, so about 20 people have the disease, okay? Now, 99% uh, of those who have the disease, if, you, if they go to the doctor, they, they get a positive result, so about 20 of those 20, right, will get it, effectively, very close. And then, how many are left that don't have the disease? 980, right? And then from that 980, 90% of them uh, will receive negative result. 10% of them will get positive result. So how many of them will get positive result? 98, right? So 98 of the people who do not have the disease will go to the doctor and will get a positive uh, result of the test. And 20 of the ones that do have the disease go and get a positive. Now you go in and you get a positive result. What's the probability that you have the disease? So the total number of people who get the positive result are how many? 20 plus 98, right? And if you're one of those 20, you have it. If you're one of the 98, you don't have it. So the probability of having the disease is 20 over 20 plus 98, right? Exactly, about 17%, right? So what did this, this just, just to give you a sense, what did this, this visit to the doctor give you? What was, what was the point of going to this doctor? So you, you, you yeah. It increased uh, your belief that you have the disease from 2% to 17%. Exactly, right? So you now don't have by 90%, you don't, it's, it's not even close to 90%, but before going to the test, your chances were 2%, because that was the, you know, the average of the population. After the test, now it's likely for that it to be 17%. Not quite high up, but it increased the chances. That's why we go to the doctor, but many doctors actually don't know this, so when you go to the doctor, you have to kind of take that into account yourself. <laughs> okay, so, uh, here what we did though, the, the intuition that I wanted to build is that you make a measurement, but if you do take into account the, what is called the prior probabilities, the larger probabilities that are out there in the environment that drive those measurements that you're making, is going to help you make better estimates, right? Because if I hadn't told you it's a, it's a rare disease, uh, you know, you go to the doctor, you get a positive result, and you say, oh, most likely I have the disease, okay? Right, then there are all sorts of complications of cost function. So maybe 17% is actually extremely important because if you have it, it might be you know, uh, a terminal disease and if you do something very easy for it, it will solve it. So there are all sorts of, uh, sort of bells and whistles that comes into it that will slowly build together into the system. So uh, let's now try to uh, sort of come up with, uh, build a toy problem where we bring these elements together and uh, try to build a little Bayesian estimator together for, for a problem that you know, is 
not too far from something many of you might be uh, dealing with in the lab. So imagine uh, there's a human subject or an animal. Uh, it's shown some stimulus. It's a, you know, uh, st stimulus whose the only thing that, that is important about it is how, this doesn't quite work, uh, is how, uh, how much uh, contrast is on it. So the top one has more contrast than the bottom one. And let's say you want to estimate this contrast. You're just looking at it. You see the visual input. This might be an experimenter wanting to do this. It might be the brain of the observer wanting to do this. So, so the task goes as such. The, this is the general framework that we'll have throughout the whole uh, um, thing that I will share with you. So there's a stimulus, goes in, into the system of the measurement, and you make a measurement about that stimulus. Now that measurement can be an experimenter making a measurement about the bold uh, signal in fMRI. That measurement can be a measurement that an experimentalist make by recording from neurons in primary visual cortex. That measurement can be the measurement that you actually, your brain actually makes when you look at that stimulus. It's perfectly fine. All of those are measurements of the stimulus. And that's kind of the, the dual, um, dual aspect of that Josh was saying, you know, both as an experimenter and as somebody who wants to understand cognition and perception, these things are similarly important. So there is a stimulus, there is a noise process, either because your devices are noisy or the brain is also not a perfect machine. You make a noisy measurement and the task that the brain wants to do or the experimenter wants to do is to use that measurement, noisy measurement, to say what the stimulus was. Right? What was the contrast of the stimulus? Thank you. So uh, this is the problem that we call inference, right? Here you make a measurement, and here you make an inference about the st state of the world, something you don't know, from the measurement, right? So we always want to keep in mind that we're assuming that this stimulus is not known. Otherwise, there's no point doing any experiment, right? The idea is that we don't know what it is. We make a measurement and then we try to figure out what it is. And the goal is to come up with both a good measurement device, that's partly you know, for the brain is what evolution tries to do, for us is better devices to make measurements, and then to come up with better ways of reading out that information, get that measurement and make estimates about the state of the world. Bayesian estimator is something that sits here among many other estimators that you may want to use to make inferences about measurements. Now let's start from something simple. Uh, think about you know, one neuron in the primary visual cortex. And as an experimenter, uh, I control the, the contrast of the stimulus. S is the stimulus. I'll change its contrast. And on many, many trials, I measure the firing rate of that one neuron. Okay? So this is, these are repeated measurements. And you see there's some sort of variability for the same exact contrast. Sometimes the neuron fires a little bit more, sometimes some, uh, a little bit less. That's something you have seen in all, all people who do electrophysiology. But any measurement device will have some noise on it. So the stimulus goes into some noisy measurement. And I'll talk more about this nomenclature uh, soon. Uh, and then there's a noisy measurement that comes out. So this M corresponds to basically one of these numbers right, on a given trial for that neuron. OK, so we can build this into some sort of a, uh, um, for now, a cartoonish model that basically this model allows us to, whenever I uh, give the stimulus, I can make an inference about what the possible uh, responses of that neuron might be. If I give 0.6, this is kind of the range of responses that I know I get from this neuron because I've done this experiment many times. So the first concept that I want to share with you, what many of you know, is called conditional, pro conditional probability. And the conditional probability is exactly this, this uh, uh, um, object here that I had here, which characterizes the, the uh, distribution of measurements for a given stimulus. So I repeat the stimulus over and over, and I get a distribution of possible uh, firing rates from that neuron. So graphically, what does that mean on this plot? And I'm trying mostly, I'll try to give you intuitions about what these things mean graphically. Because if you, you kind of, I imagine if you understand it, the, the concepts, then the, the math comes a little bit uh, more uh, straightforwardly. So the conditional probability is when I know what the stimulus is, and I want to know the distribution of measurements, right? In this plot, it will be a vertical line, where it's aligned to a particular stimulus. 
And then here I have the range of measurements, right? And this could be a probability distribution. Everybody's with me up to here? So that's conditional probability, and we can change it to another stimulus. That conditional probability will change. We'll change it to another stimulus. That conditional probability will change, right? So basically, when we do the experiment, several measurements, we characterize this whole conditional probability, which means all the possible measurement for a given stimulus. OK. Now, I want to introduce to you the concept of likelihood, which is a very much related, but uh, sort of a conceptually different way of thinking about the, this graph. So the likelihood is what the person who wants to make the inference needs to think about. The likelihood is a um, function of the stimulus. So we imagine that, for example, we now have a particular measurement, and we want to know what are the likely stimuli that could have given rise to that firing rate. Okay, So it kind of reverses the problem. The conditional probability says, what are the measurements given the stimulus? The likelihood says, what are the likely stimuli given the measurement? Okay. Now, to visualize this, I guess you can imagine anybody ventures what it will look like on the graph. Horizontal, Horizontal line, right? So now we have a given measurement, and then we have a range of stimuli that characterize the likelihood of the stimulus. Okay? And if we make a different measurement, the likely stimuli will change, right? And you can imagine that the brain might use this information. It, it receives some input from the neurons in the primary visual cortex, and from that, it might be able to infer, based on this, what the contrast of the stimulus is. Same for an experimenter. Okay? So, now, you see, though, some parts are more tricky than others, right here. So if, if, if the, the, this neuron fires 58 spikes per second, uh, impulses per second, then the whole range of stimuli are likely, right? It's a little bit harder to tell. And that already uh, uh, sort of gives you the, the horizontal lines and the vertical lines on this, this uh, graph are, don't have exactly the same characteristics, although they both are exactly coming from this distribution, right? So we didn't change the graph. This graph is the probability of the measurement given the stimulus. This is what this graph is. But if we look at it along the vertical lines, we are looking at probability of measurements. And if we look at it along the horizontal lines, we're looking at the likelihood. And they're not the same. This is a somewhat of a subtle uh, and uh, nuanced kind of a concept. Uh, is everybody clear on that? Anybody, any question before we go on? Yeah? I, I guess I'm really confused by the equals. Yeah. So they're, they're both a function of S and M. It's equal, meaning that every number that you put here, you put a measurement, and then you find the likely stimuli, and the numbers that come out are exactly the numbers that come out of this. So if you specify M and S, these two are always the same. That's all I mean by the equal sign. What is the semicolon? Well, so that's just um, pe many different people, uh, that pe different people have many different ways of, of uh, sort of using symbols for likelihood. This is my way of saying that the likelihood is really most, uh, most importantly, is a function of the stimulus. It sort of specifies something about the stimulus, and, but you need to know the measurement. If you don't know the measurement, then you can't say some, anything about the stimulus. So you know the measurement is 58, and you say, now, what is the uh, stimulus? OK? So it really doesn't convey anything except just some way of putting a symbol on. on. I need to say these two are different, although they're really mathematically uh, governed by the same um, functional form, but they really represent something very different. Everybody's clear on that? OK. So with that in mind, now let's move on to the second part of this estimation. So let's say we want to build an estimator. So now we have a measurement. And because now we have some, some sense of the concept of the likelihood, maybe we can now, based on the measurement, make an estimate of 
the stimulus based on the measurement. This would be something that, for example, a rat might need to do, given the firing rate in a particular part of her brain, figure out where it is, okay, in space. That will be, you have the measurement, which are some firing rate, and you want to figure out where you are, because you don't quite know. Only, you have the measure, only, only the rat has the measurements available to it. Okay, so here is the first estimator that I want to, um, uh, sort of share with you, which is called the maximum likelihood estimator. What it does is that basically, it, for each measurement, it figures out the likelihood of all the stimuli, basically this function, as a function of the stimulus, and then it picks the one that is the peak of that likelihood, right? So that's called the maximum likelihood estimate. Uh, an observer, an experimenter, or a piece of uh, brain machinery that uses this strategy to make estimation basically implements some sort of a function here where the function extracts the likelihood based on the measurement and takes the peak. Okay? That will be one estimator. And that's the starting point for me to get to now a Bayesian estimator, which is a build up over what I already have talked about, which is the maximum likelihood estimator. You notice up to this point, I didn't say a word about prior expectation, and although we started by that, I took a detour to say, you know, when you don't have prior expectation, what is the general framework that we want to deal with? There is a stimulus, there is a measurement, we want to know what the stimulus is. And even without any prior knowledge, you still have a statistical problem to solve, because the system is noisy. Here is one way to solve it, the maximum likelihood estimation. I'm not going to tell you about all the great things that the maximum likelihood estimation has, but you know, asymptotically is unbiased, it's a robust estimator, it has a lot of qualities, that's why a lot of people like it. There are a lot of other things you can do. You can say, you know, I'm not going to take the peak, I'm going to take the average, or I'm going to do some other things. Those are all estimators, and you're free to, to, to use your own estimator. But if you don't know the characteristics of your estimator, it might give you a, a highly variable estimate or a biased estimate. And those things matter. So you want to use the, understand the estimator using. OK, so uh, now, for those of you who have a computer, uh, uh, I want to start by you know, doing one example of this, uh, which is implement the likelihood function, because then, then it will get more and more uh, challenging. So here, here is the, the likelihood function, the uh, conditional probability, and it's characterized by these functions. So, the measurement that we get from a neuron is a function of the stimulus. So this is the function of the stimulus, right? That's R of S. So you give the S, there is an R of S which characterizes the measurement, and then there is noise added to it, right? Variability. So R of S, if you have your computer and your MATLAB, try to implement a function like this that will look very much like what you're seeing here, okay? So you need to write a little piece of code that gets S, and S can go from 0 to 1, right? S goes from 0 to 1, and then you have this function R of S, which is going to characterize the response of the neuron effectively as a function of the stimulus. And then you have a piece of variability, this N noise, and the noise is sampled from a Gaussian distribution. I don't know if you're familiar with the formulation of the Gaussian distribution. Anybody here doesn't know the, the formulation for Gaussian distribution? I can just explain it very quickly. No? Okay. Uh, so five is the standard deviation, and there is no mean to it. So it's a zero mean Gaussian distribution, which means every time you make a measurement, it kind of perturbs it a little bit, and the standard deviation of those perturbation is five. Okay? So. The goal here is to, so now you have a system, let's say you really are recording from this neuron, right? So here is a, here is a real example in the, in the lab. You're re recording from this neuron, and you have already characterized these features of the neuron. You know how it responds to the stimulus, because you made the measurement several times, and you have characterized this noise, and the noise is well characterized by a Gaussian noise. This is all very uh, unrealistic, but you know, that's, the, the point here is to just convey the, the, the concept. So you have a neuron that you have fully characterized. Now, on a given trial, this neuron fires 58 spikes per second. What is your best guess of the stimulus? That's the problem we're trying to solve. 
So mathematically, you want to construct the likelihood at the point of 58 spikes per second. And then find the peak of it. And the first three people that get their hands up that they solve it will move on. Let's you struggle with it for a little bit before I give you an answer. Hmm? You want to plot? <coughs> Just a number. What is the maximum likelihood? Tell me what the contrast of the stimulus is. Yeah. Yeah. The likelihood is. I'll just write it down here. So the likelihood which is the probability of measurement given uh, sample yes. is, ooh, is going to be is going to be a Gaussian right around the average value with a standard deviation of I'm just going to write it down, right? I'm going to write it down. So it's 1 over square root of 2. So you know that the standard deviation for all those points is 5, right? Because noise standard deviation is 5 for all of them. So the probability of measurement given stimulus is going to have a standard deviation of 5. And now this is just the Gaussian. I'm just writing the Gaussian. So it's going to be 2, 5 squared. And now here. For example, for this particular stimulus, what is the mean response? How can I measure the mean response, let's say, for 0.6? Hmm? R of S, exactly. Somebody said R of S, right? So R of S is the average by definition. So then here is R of S uh, minus M squared. That is the likelihood function. Does it make sense? So if you now, if you now specify s right, to be something, 0.5, r of s is going to be what point? So you go 0.5 up, r of s is going to be exactly this point right here. right? And then this is a distribution around that number with a standard deviation of 5, right? So if you have this function, you basically now, the only thing you need to do is to put the measurement at the value that, that we want, 58. We know measurement we said is 58 spikes per second. And find the s that makes this maximum, basically plot it as a function of s. There will be an S that makes it maximum. That's the maximum likelihood estimate. Yeah, yeah. Very good. 0.72. Anybody takers? Okay, very good. 0.78 is close enough, I guess. MATLAB, I don't know how, if it has that much error, but <laughs> that's fine. Another one? Ballpark, you have to be right, right? So if we go 58 spike per second, we draw a line here. It's the peak is around here. I guess 0.7 seems right, right? And, and the visual actually is far more important than you'll, you'll later figure out exactly how to do this mathematically. But the idea is should be straightforward, right? You, if, if you make this measurement, you know how to plot this from your neuron or from your recordings, then you have a measurement. And you know the maximum likelihood is take the measurement, draw a line, and on this line, find the uh, point where you have maximum number of dots or whitest, right? That's the maximum likelihood estimate. That's it. OK? Should we move on? Anybody think they have kind of 
are okay to move on from likelihood now to, to Bayesian estimate? This is a starting point. Without the likelihood, it's almost impossible to, to uh, build Bayesian integration. That's without any prior. Perfect. Okay, we have three now. Let's move on. Yeah. 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 So the steps are as such. The the steps is we're gonna we're gonna write mathematically when you want to do it mathematically you're gonna write mathematically this shape. As soon as you write this shape mathematically, then everything is straightforward. So how do, and, and the challenge is actually getting all of this information and having this image and write an equation that explains this. So what is the equation that explains this? The equation that explains this for any point, for any particular stimulus, point eight, I first need to know where the mean of this white region is, right? I first need to know the mean of this white region, which is you know, the mean for the measurement, and then I have some noise around it. If I write that, basically I have written the likelihood because the likelihood is relating the stimuli to measurement. So that's what we do. We know the shape of this noise here is Gaussian because we specified it as Gaussian. So any point you get here, any point you get here is basically the same function except it has moved to the mean, to the appropriate mean, right? So it's this function, when it's put here, it looks like this, here it looks like this, here it looks like this. This is all this function. Fair enough? So to write it, you basically rewrite this function. Now think about n. What is n? Re re rearrange this equation. What is n? Is m minus r of s, right? Everybody's with me up to here? So basically, the only thing I need to do is to put instead of n here, m minus r of s. That's what I've done here. That's all I did. OK? Now you have this. Now how do we find the maximum likelihood? You give me a measurement, let's say 58. I plug it in here. Now this becomes a function of s, right? For a, one s, this number will be big. For another s, it will be small. For different s's, it will be different. And I want to find the s that maximizes this. Now, what is the r of s that maximizes this? m, right? The r of s that maximizes this is the same as m because if you plot this, this is a Gaussian where the mean of it is m. So the stimulus that maximizes the likelihood is the one for which r of s is 58. So the, the way to solve this is that put 58 here and see what s corresponds to 58. Right? Basically, we're saying if it's 58 spikes per second, then R of S should be 58 spikes per second. So what S makes this 50, uh, R of S 58? So, so in fact, you know, the whole issue of noise was actually completely irrelevant because the noise is Gaussian. You could have solved this by simply ignoring all of this and just figuring out what S you should put here so that this will be 58. If it's not Gaussian, it's asymptotically unbiased. So for a small sample of data, it might give rise to a biased estimate. The maximum likelihood is always like that. OK, so let's move on now. Everybody OK? Move on to Bayesian? OK, so Bayesian estimation. Where's my? Oh, thanks. So Bayesian estimation. Now. Same structure that we had. There is a stimulus, there is a noise process, it gives rise to a measurement, and we're going to try to infer the S from the M. Now, we did all of this. The key point that I wanted to convey to you is that Bayesian estimation is nothing but just a different F. That's all what Bayesian estimation is. So up to now, you saw what maximum likelihood is. 
That's one of these F's. There is another F that corresponds to Bayesian estimator. In fact, there's a whole class of F's that corresponds to Bayesian estimators. Now, let's try to work that out, how that works. So a Bayesian estimator is just another F of TM, F of M. But what it does, instead of finding the max of the likelihood, it's a little bit more elaborate. It allows you to minimize, minimize, some cost over what is called the posterior. Now what is the posterior? The posterior is exactly what you computed when we were talking about that medical test. You didn't take the 90% into account only, but you took into account the extra information that only 2% of the population have the disease. That's the prior. So you have that prior information that's independent of your actual measurement, right? The fact that 2% have the, the disease has nothing to do with the fact that you went and did a medical test and you get, got positive or negative. So those are two independent pieces of information. One is this prior information and one is the likelihood information which is you know, your measurement or the, the medical test. You multiply these two. This is just a normalization factor to make this into a probability. So forget about this for now. Uh, you have your likelihood. You're now familiar with this, right? Up to now we've been working with this object to do all the stuff that we did. The only thing that the Bayesian does is that it multiplies it by what is called the prior distribution. In the case of the medical test is 80% no disease, 20% disease, that's the prior. We build it for the contrast case so it becomes a little bit more uh, tangible. So when you multiply these two, out comes the probability of the stimulus given the measurement, which is in fact, if you think about it, is really what we want. What the brain wants ultimately is to know what is the stimulus given the neural activity. That's what the brain has access to, neural activity. So it knows the neural activity, it wants to figure out what is out there in the world. So really this is the probability that the brain wants to be able to work with. Whether it can or not is a different question, but it's an ideal situation the brain wants to be able to say what are the probability of all the possible things out there in the world given that I just saw this neural activity in my mind, in my brain. Right? That's this. It's called the posterior and in, in one of the homeworks, in one of the, the problem sets you'll see that the, the idea is that you can very easily straightforwardly compute this by multiplying the likelihood by the prior. You already did this for the medical test. Mathematically it's a little bit less uh, uh, tangible, but it's, uh, it's exactly what you did. You said, okay, 2% have the disease, 10% they get it, 2% uh, have the disease, and from the 980, 90% uh, don't get the disease, don't get the uh, um, uh, test. So you did the multiplication already, the 2% to get the 20 out, and then you did the 10% to get the 98 people out. So you already did this multiplication in your medical test uh, sort of example. Okay, so formally what is Bayesian integration? I want to kind of be, be accurate about the, be precise about the description and, and then we'll build intuition. So really any Bayesian estimator has three components to it. One is one that you already know very well, the likelihood function, which is the relationship between some noisy measurement and the state of the world or something that you're interested. There is a second one, which is the prior, which we just talked about, which is the, all the possible S's out there in the world, or all the possible S's out in there inside the brain, whatever it might be, the, the variables of your interest. These two jointly provide this posterior, which is the probability of the stimulus given the measurement. And the third component is what is called the cost function. And it's sort of cost of making an estimate S sub E when the true value is S. Now think about this a little bit to see if the cost function makes sense. Imagine you're supposed to do an estimation. It's an animal that has to estimate which of two chambers might, might uh, be uh, providing uh, shock versus you know, sweet sucrose. It wants to, to, to uh, measure that. Okay, so it you know, has some measurements from the past. That's probably P of S, right? And then this particular trial, there's this sound and noise and stuff going on, suggesting that maybe one of them is more likely to be shock. That's this one. Now they build these two and they have this. Why is a cost function important? Because 
not getting perhaps the sweet sucrose is okay, but getting a shock is really bad. So the, the rat might want to actually uh, make uh, a biased, kind of bias itself towards uh, possibilities of avoiding the shock, okay? And in that case, so the cost function that the rat is gonna take into account is not gonna just be, if, if it's 51, per, let's put it this way, let's say this posterior tells the rat is 51% left sweet, 49% shock right, okay? With 51 and 49, if I'm the rat, I'll say, no, you know what? I'll, I'm happy to, to take a risk with, uh, with a 49 and go with uh, the sucrose, uh, avoiding the shock, All right? Basically, uh, I should have said it the other way. 51% uh, is, sh the, the probability of left being the shock versus right being the shock, and um, I have to construct this well. So there is these two chambers. Here, the likelihood of getting a shock is, uh, you know, that this is the, the reason is that the, the, the nuance of the likelihood versus probability is catching my, me as well. So likelihood is not a probability. So it's not 80-20. So likelihood is a number that actually doesn't add up to one. So let's say the likelihood of, um, getting a shock here is x, the likelihood of getting shock here is 2x, so it's higher here, but it's also the likelihood of getting reward here is 2y and reward y, right? So it's pretty much, you know, you can go either way, but because the shock is really bad, you might bias your response towards the, the, the uh, side that otherwise would have been the same probability. So cost function allows you to, you know, if you want to jump over a river, you want to jump, because the cost of going a little bit short is really worse than going a little bit farther, you may want to bias yourself to jump even farther, okay? That's the idea of, you want to estimate the length of the river, but you use the cost function to make a better estimate that will avoid costs, okay? That's the concept. Now, so formally then, what we want to do is to find this posterior, and say over this posterior, I want to go for the estimate. This is a lot of math saying something simple, which is I want to go for the estimate S of E that over all possible S's will minimize this cost. So I'm going to average across all possible S's. Each S, I'm going to assume S1, what's the cost of this one? S2, what's the cost of that one? I'm going to get the average of all of those. I'm going to go with the S that on average makes the minimum cost or maximum reward. That's what the Bayesian estimator is. That's what this you know, little piece of math tells you. Now, graphically, what does it mean? So let's think about a given cost function, a simple cost function. I'm not going to take you through the details of Bayesian estimation with different cost functions, but I want to, again, like the likelihood, want to give you a graphical intuition that hopefully will kind of resonate. So imagine a cost function which is called a squared error cost function. What does a, qu a squared error cost function mean? That means that the animal in some sense, or the subject in some sense, is going to penalize itself by the square of its error. So if I make you know, one degree error, it's bad to some extent. If I make four degree error, it's 16 times worse. Okay? That's one possible cost function. It's very typical for Bayesian integration. That's this cost function. Now, given this cost function, so I've plotted this cost function right here, right? SE minus S squared, that's a quadratic function right at the SE. And here is the posterior, probability of S given M. So you know you have made a measurement and you know this is the distribution of all possible S's given that measurement. Now which S of E should you pick? That's the question that the Bayesian estimator wants to solve, right? So if it, and remember, to, to compute the, uh, the, the total cost, you want to multiply this point by point by the posterior, right? So to get the co total cost. So if, we put, if, if the subject uses this particular SE that I have drawn here, is it a good choice or a bad choice? Is, that, is it associated with a lot of cost or a little cost? Hmm? Minimal cost, this is the best? How do you elaborate? How do you, how do you guess that? 
So the cost is this function, right? This going up means the cost is high. This means cost is high. This point means cost is zero, right? And this is the probability of all the stimuli. Where should we, which SE should we pick? We can pick SE here, we can pick it here, we can pick it here. Which SE is the right choice given that this is the probability of all the stimuli? Yeah? Hmm? Some, something close to the peak. Why? A little, right. a little bit to the right of the peak. Perfect. So uh, first, let's say why peak close to the peak is a good place. So remember, we're going to multiply. So these are costs. So this is going to be, here is going to be $1, $4, $16, right? These are costs. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to basically you know, make the subject pay for the error they make. And this is the probability that that cost will happen, because this is the probability of the stimulus. So if you put the, the, if the subject says, this is my estimate, then it's quite likely that actually stimulus will be here, right? Because that's a very high probability stimulus. And that will incur a huge cost. Everybody's with me? So if we put the SE right on top of this, what happens? then for the stimulus that is most likely, or most probable, the cost is zero. Other stimuli that are you know, less probable do incur cost, but it's a good choice. It's a better choice than the other ones, and that's the whole point of optimizing, minimizing the cost over all possible uh, stimuli. That's the idea of the Bayesian estimator. So, of course, the exact choice depends on the form of this posterior, on and on the form of the cost function. Everybody's now sort of clear on that, right? If I change the shape of the cost function, like make it asymmetric, any underestimation is extremely costly, overestimations are okay, all right? So I make this function kind of like very steep and then very shallow here. That means underestimation is extremely costly, overestimations not very costly. Then what would you want to do? Push it to? Left or right? This way? If I push it this way, then this high cost coincides with high probability. You want to push it to the left, right? So that you go left and left, therefore, this very low cost coincides with, with probable stimuli. So you reduce your cost, right? OK, that's that. So you, know, you can pick a different place. And in this case, it turns out, this is actually one of the, the uh, problem sets, in the case of least squared, the mean of the posterior, the mean of this distribution, in fact, is the uh, Bayesian estimate. So here now we have a new Bayesian a new f of m. I talked to you about the maximum likelihood as one f of m. Here is another f of m, and, and here, in fact, two. So here is one estimator, which p takes the peak of the posterior, and remember, the posterior is the prior multiplied by the likelihood, it's proportional to. But so here is one estimator. This is one function, f. This is another function. And these corresponds to different cost functions, which I'm not going to go through, details of the cost functions. OK. Now given this, let's go back to our contrast estimation task and use a Bayesian estimator except I'm going to give you one extra piece of information, which is the possible contrast that, that the stimulus uh, has. So that's the prior. OK, so let's go back to our example. You know this is the likelihood. We built it together, right, based on these functions. So this is going to be the measurement, some measurement in the brain, you know, uh, calcium signal, spiking activity, fMRI, whatever, that the, even something that the brain is using that we don't know. Okay. So that's the measurement. This is the stimulus. And we know if you make a measurement which is right here, what you would do is that you will build this likelihood function and take the peak of this, and that will be the maximum likelihood estimate. Everybody's OK with that up to this point? OK. What if I give you an extra piece of information which says all the stimuli have a contrast that is characterized by this function, which is right around the middle, the probability that the contrast is right around the middle is pretty high. 
And as you go away, very low contrasts are not very probable, and very high contrasts are not very probable either. That's some prior. Let's say you're in a, uh, in a room or in, a, in an environment where everything is on average gray. Uh, 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 it's actually not gray. It has a medium contrast, not totally gray and not totally black and white. Right? So if all the stimuli are of this class, and you now have this information, how would you incorporate it to do a better job? Why is this not a good, why, the, why is the maximum likelihood not a good estimate? Because look at them where the maximum likelihood is. The maximum likelihood is right here. It's sort of falling on contrasts that are not very like, not very probable, right? The prior constraints that, the, that really this is not a very highly probable stimulus. Where is it going to be? If we, do a, if we uh, apply a Bayesian estimator, how is it going to move the estimate? To the left, right? It's going to push it towards the more probable stimuli. OK? So how do we build a posterior? Now you know that. How do we use these two to build a posterior? Multiply them together, OK? So we multiply them together, this comes out. OK, so this is now the likelihood function. This is the prior. And you multiply them. And out comes something that, for example, says that here things are almost impossible, very, very low probability. Here things are very, very low probability. And of course, these are uh, sort of constraints that comes from the prior, right? So it changes the way we're going to make estimates. And how is it going to change it? Well, this is the maximum likelihood. But if you look at this measurement, the point that, for example, has the highest probability is slightly to the left of it, right? That is the whitest. And that's going to be what we call the map estimate, which is the peak of the posterior, right? So basically, if you make this measurement, if the, some machine makes this measurement, and it has no knowledge about the prior, it goes, for example, with the maximum likelihood estimate, it's going to make an inference that this was the stimulus. If it has some knowledge of the prior, it will go with another estimate. And I'm not going to show you why this, is, this works better or what, what it uh, optimizes for, but we know this particular uh, map estimate, which is peak of the posterior, is the best you can do for a particular cost function. I didn't tell you about that cost function, but for a particular cost function, this is the thing to do that will minimize that cost. OK, and in one dimension, basically, this is kind of the likelihood. This is the, the prior. And you multiply these two, and out comes this distribution, which is the posterior. Everybody's here with me? This is basically a one-dimensional version of this range here. That's the likelihood. This is the prior. I've kind of re replicated them, and then overlaid on it the posterior. And here is the peak. OK, so this will be the peak of the posterior to pick. OK, I'm going to uh, wrap it up by saying, sort of putting together all the stuff that we talked about. So the world that we're talking about is a world in which there is a stimulus out there. There is a state of the world out there. There is some variable of interest out there, whatever it, you, you like it to be. Something that is out there and you don't know it, or the experimenter doesn't know it and wants to know it. And to know it, you make some measurements. And the fact that you make some measurements, if your measurements were perfect, they will be done. There will be nothing else to do. But any measurement device that we use, including our brains, is going to be uh, having all sorts of uh, sources of variability. So you'll make a measurement. And if you know the, the, the forms of noise, you can also know the likelihood function. We know that, right? right? So if you know p of m given s, you have the likelihood function. On the other hand, from experience, from you know, knowledge about the statistical regularities in the world, or just from false beliefs, you might have some prior expectation. You might believe that you know, there, is a, there is something behind the door, and there is nothing behind the door. But you use that to make estimates. And that comes into the process of estimation, and that's the prior distribution. Now we talked about from these two, you can simply multiply them to get what the posterior is. And now that you have the posterior, depending on what costs 
you want to minimize or what goals you have or what utility or reinforcement the animal has experienced, all sorts of experimental settings, right? Depending on what you want to optimize for, you will have some function to take into account. And then you put these two together to come up with a particular uh, estimator. And that estimator is going to be that f, that function f, that allows you to make an inference from the m to know what the stimulus was. That's the whole machinery that we, we go through. Now, uh, I want to close it down here, but sort of take five minutes to, to answer questions and then go through the, the problem sets. Any questions? Yeah. I'm looking at this about, uh, can, you, can you go back two slides? Mm -hmm. so, yeah. One more. Further? Uh, yeah, yeah, sorry, sorry. Show the F map again on the last one. So right there it seems to be doing great, but in the previous slide, it didn't seem to account, it, its cost function didn't seem to account for you know, uh, a bad, a bad outcome. So if you go back one more slide, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, so, so it seems to, it's centered, it's at the maximum. It uh -huh. seems great, but you, you, you said that the BLS, it seems to be more strategic because it, you know, if it falls to the left, then mm -hmm. you've, you've incurred all this cost. So I'm a little confused as to why. Yeah, so you want to get into the notion of what, what are these costs that these different estimators associated yeah. with. This estimator, the Bayes least square estimator considers all possibilities. So it says that, for example, if I am, it's, it's, a, it's a sort of a graded cost. If I go farther away, it's more costly. This map is actually a different cost function associated with a cost function of this kind. It says, if I get it right, it's a jackpot. If I get it the tiniest bit wrong, I get nothing. That's the cost function. Okay. It's called a delta cost function. So it's a cost function that basically it penalizes you for the slightest error. And if you get it, you get it. Okay. If you go with that cost function, if that's the cost function you want to optimize for, then you will take the peak. Yeah. Anything else? So, uh, I guess, yes. With, when you were working with? Uh -huh. Yeah. So if you, if you, for example, if the, uh, the you mean as a, from an experimental point of view, for the brain point of view, yeah, it, I as mean, soon as you. Yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah, absolutely. And, and so, yeah. So, so there are um, there are a couple of. Uh, so, first of all, it is certainly the case that, for example, if I put an observer in a situation where there are sophisticated correlations between multiple dimensions of the stimuli, they might actually not be able to do optimize for some particular cost function. And the reason for that could be either they didn't quite understand the structure of the likelihood, they didn't quite understand the prior. So any of the, the various aspects of, of um, error in estimating for any system, the prior or the likelihood or the cost function will lead to an estimator that will not really optimize for what it was what's, what's trying to optimize. Right? So that's I guess the that's just comes straightforward from the math. If you don't know the likelihood and you plug in the wrong likelihood, well you get the wrong answer. That's obviously the case. Now there are ways to uh, and and in fact working with likelihoods has another element to it which is implicit we didn't talk about which is you can't really work with likelihood unless you have actually a model of the noise or some some knowledge about what is the underlying distribution what is the generative process that leads to that observation right so uh, 
For certain conditions, you might have a good estimate of the noise process. For some other conditions, you might not have. There are arguments that has been made that, you know, for example, there are certain regularities in the variability in, for example, cortical circuits. And maybe one of the things that that regularity, which means, for example, a Poisson-like distribution of, of firing rates, one of the things that that regularity has in it is that for a particular class of statistics, like Poisson statistics, then you can play simple tricks, even if you don't know the exact form of the likelihood function, you can do play tricks that still gets you to the optimal response without knowing the likelihood. So that's number two, which is, you know, even if you have, don't have full information, still you might be able to implement a Bayesian estimator. In fact, it's possible to implement a Bayesian estimator without knowing the prior or the likelihood, right? So it's, it, there, are, there are ways to, to construct f of m directly that will optimize just based on reward. Remember, f of m is basically a transfer function. You can learn the transfer function without uh, knowing all the details of what these different distributions are. But to make probabilistic kind of reasoning, you do have to have an estimate of the likelihood and the prior. Now, as an experimentalist, that's sort of the cognitive aspect or the brain aspect of it. As an experimentalist, with when we're collecting more and more data, it's becoming less and less possible to estimate these things. There are some tricks you can do to, um, to do a directed search for the pattern. So what we want to compute is this, right? P of M given S. There are some ways to do this more efficiently than other. One way to do it is that you just sample. And if you sampling, you know, you, you do different S's and you get different M's. If you do that and you're dealing with, you know, 10 dimensions, well, yes, all, all bets are off, right? But if you do a smart search, which is, you know, for example, you start from something that, that I don't have time to talk, but you start from some model, some Gaussian process model, and then based on, you have some knowledge about the, the kernel that you put as the covariance of those structures, then you can do a better search. Still, it doesn't completely solve the problem, but you can do it a little bit better, yeah. Yeah, just to add another perspective to that. Um, so, you know, if, if you take a Bayesian statistics class, like if you go over to Harvard where they have a statistics department, take a Bayesian statistics class, a lot of what you learn is how to deal with these problems. Because right? if you look at what most statisticians are doing today, they aren't analyzing one dimensional problems, they're analyzing problems with hundreds or thousands of variables, particularly or 10,000 or whatever, right? Um, and similarly, if you're interested in to what extent the brain might do something Bayesian, you know, like uh, one of the, there's a BCS student, Hedges Kulkarni, who works with me and others, who's just over giving a really nice talk at CBPR, the computer vision and pattern vision, on a sort of Bayesian, very general view of perception, face perception, human body perception, surface perception, from a Bayesian point of view, where you know, the models he's building have tens of thousands of random variables. And the general approach that, whether you're a Bayesian statistician or that Hedges is using, involves making various kinds of effective algorithms, like computation algorithms for approximating the computation of these high dimensional posteriors that are often based around some kind of sampling, right? So some kind of random, structured random process, like a Monte Carlo process of some sort, that doesn't necessarily explicitly compute the district of these nice distributions that you're seeing here, but just generates some <coughs> bag of samples from the posterior, uh, for example, that then you could use to either you know, reasoning or, or plug into a decision estimator or to, or, you know, with some loss function. So in general, the idea of sampling is the, is the probably the, the single most broadly accepted strategy for dealing with this, either in Bayesian statistics or Bayesian data analysis, or in uh, sort of Bayesian models of perception, for example. And there's some people who think the brain does that. That, like, for example, some people think that you can make sense of stochastic neural activity as some kind of sign of the brain, for example. But that's pretty controversial. And, uh, I don't think there's any general, generally good accepted views or empirically grounded views on how that works in general. Although people have looked at particular circuits and said, okay, here is the spike seems to be doing something that we kind of interpret as a sample. But this not, doesn't have a straightforward, I mean, the, the, this, it's, it's a bag of tricks, like Josh says. It's a bag but of tricks. You shouldn't think, oh, I want to work on a high dimensional problem, therefore I shouldn't use no. Bayesian no. methods. Like no. the, entire, uh, the entire field of Bayesian statistics. Uh, is, is all about basic, basically as an answer. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Okay.